There's a moment when the sun disappears, disappears. when darkness falls and you're left with just your fears. Fear. That's the moment you feel your first pang of doubt. That's the moment when, when the, the night, night comes, comes out. out. The Night Comes Out presents The Cut Through, Part 2. A young girl has vanished. Now another young woman has appeared. How are these two things connected? It's a question these detectives will try to answer when the night comes out. Roy arrived at the Dent house 20 minutes after the call. Mad was already there. The call had come in and dispatch had immediately called the detectives. There had been so many cranks, the chief didn't want to create a disturbance with dozens of cars, lights flashing, and uniforms all over. The uniforms were on standby, however. The woman had come back around not long after she fainted. An ambulance had arrived, but its lights and sirens were off. The woman sat in the back of the ambulance. A worried Mary stood on her porch. Roy approached her first. What's happened? He asked. I don't know, Mary said. I'm so confused. She said she was Ashley and fainted. She was naked and dirty. Look at her. She's so thin, and there are bruises all over her. Is she a drug addict, maybe? Roy pondered aloud. I would think so, but she has all of Ashley's marks. Red hair, blue eyes with gold flecks. Ashley has the birthmark on her thigh about the size of a quarter. When she was three, she ran into the corner of a coffee table and had to get stitches above her left eye. This woman has that scar, too. Roy frowned and turned his head to look at the ambulance. Matt was there, trying to talk to the woman. The woman stared straight ahead, the blanket the paramedics had given her pulled up to her chin. John? She has to be a crank detective. Jesus, Ashley's a kid. This girl is at least ten years older than our daughter. How is that possible? I don't know. Roy muttered. Has she said anything else since she woke up? Nothing, Mary said. I tried to get her food or something to drink. She didn't even seem to notice. All things considered, Mary seemed to have her shit together, Roy mused. Even John, who had been quick to anger over the last three weeks, appeared very calm. Okay, guys, let me go talk to Detective Dreyfus he said. Don't go anywhere. Not on your life, Mary replied. Roy tried to give them a reassuring look, but he was too worried to pull it off. He sauntered over to the ambulance. Matt saw him coming and jumped down from the back of the vehicle. Well, this is fucked, the younger detective stated. As she talked, Matt shrugged. She says, Mary's her mom. She told me so when I got here. She said, that's my mom. Since then, she's been like this. What do the paramedics say? Roy asked. She's in shock. She's also suffering from hypothermia and is severely malnourished. Roy rubbed a hand over his face. He wanted a drink and he wanted to go to bed. Mostly, he wanted answers. Well... They should get her to the hospital and make sure she's okay, Roy said. She's obviously not going to talk again tonight. She seems exhausted, Roy. 
the most exhausted person I've ever seen. What she's gone through and whoever she is, she's been through serious shit. Get her to the hospital. Go with her. They'll get her hydrated and get food into her. Maybe she'll want to talk then. Matt agreed and stepped into the ambulance. Roy walked over to one of the paramedics. Make sure the doctors admit her. He said. I want her in a secured room, too. The paramedic said he'd relay the message. The ambulance drove off and Roy pulled out his phone. Yeah, she's going to the hospital, but we need to have guards on the room. Roy explained to the chief. I'm going to talk to the dents and look around. I don't think whoever she is will tell us much tonight. Matt will make sure the doctors get a full talk screen, and I'll see what I can do to get a psych consult. The call ended, and Roy rubbed his eyes. Too many things happening at once. He was getting slower these days. Hard to take care of those things as they flew at him anymore. He turned around to head back over to the dents. Who is she? John asked. We have no idea. Roy stated. She had no clothing, no identification other than the marks you saw. Nothing. Mary said, tears coursed slowly down her face. Whoever she is, she's been through a lot. I mean, look at her. Yes, yeah, she has. Roy agreed. Now, if we can just figure out who did this and why. My guess is it's possible she was being held somewhere. Who knows for how long and what she went through, but it looks bad. Think of the worst thing you can imagine, then double it. Maybe she saw a news story about your daughter and decided this was who she was. I have known people who have been through great psychological and physical torture who have a total break with reality. They create new identities for themselves to cope. This is all just conjecture, but... It doesn't seem like she'd scar herself up like that just to come here and end up in the hospital. It's not like there's some financial gain here. It sounds horrible. Mary whispered. It is. Rory said. I know this is hard on you too. I'm sorry. You guys being in the media will bring out crazy people. I wish that weren't the case, but it happens. We know. John said. We've had phone calls and emails, people telling us they know where Ashley is, people just making threats. We forward most of them to your office. Bray knew about these. He'd read through most of them because he had to. At the beginning of the investigation, there were so many emails and calls, he and Matt sometimes spent all day listening or reading. People were vicious, even to parents who had lost their child. I'd suggest you go inside. Take the phone off the hook. Don't go online. We're doing our best to keep this quiet here, but your neighbor surely saw the ambulance. Maybe just stay away from the news. Read a book. Anything. Mary and John nodded at the same time. I'm going to search around the neighborhood. Roy said. I doubt I'll find much. Our best hope is she snaps out of it once the doctors take a look at her and we get some answers. Mary and John went inside. There wasn't much else to say. Roy watched them go. It hurt his heart to watch them. So much pain and there was still the spark behind their eyes. A spark Roy knew all too well. It was hope. The hope they would catch the murderer. He had seen the hope of the burglar being found and money returned from those who were robbed. The dense hope was they would still find Ashley alive. He had seen it before, so many times. Sometimes the hope burned bright and the solution presented itself so it could flare brighter. He was the hero. Far too often, the worst part was the light going out as hope was lost. He wanted to find Ashley for them. Roy walked down the sidewalk. None of the neighbors were outside now, but it was hard to shake the feeling he was being watched. Fine, let them. He would provide them no answers. No press had shown up, 
No television station helicopters buzzed overhead. Roy kept his eyes down on the ground. It wasn't hard to find the footprints. The woman was barefoot. It had rained pretty consistently for the past two days. If she ran through mud, which it appeared she had, then she'd leave a trail. Roy walked down the curb and across the street, then down the sidewalk. After a moment, he looked up to see where he was. Immediately, he had a sinking feeling in his gut. You have got to be fucking kidding. He muttered. The prints were clearer here. Her feet had been dirtier, slowly cleaned off walking through the wet grass and stepping in a puddle. Down the sidewalk, then up the driveway. A moment later, he stopped between two sets of townhomes. Fuck. He muttered. He and Matt had stood here weeks ago. The very first day Ashley had vanished, as a matter of fact. The forensic guys had gone over this area with fine-toothed combs. They had found nothing. No fibers, no strange hairs, no DNA from anything connected to a human. Plenty of dog pee, but little else. Nothing showing Ashley had been grabbed or anything violent had happened. Here he was again. The footprints led right up the grass before vanishing once the lawn started. Then more footprints in the muddy parts around the paving stones someone had set into the ground, leading to the cut-through. Roy continued to follow. When he reached the halfway point, there was an indentation in the wet grass. Something had fallen here. The footprints started right after the indentation. She fell here, he said to himself. And she got up, ran off that way. He turned to look back, following the trail with his eyes. He could see it in his mind clearly. The lost woman, up on her feet, then one desire. Just one place she wanted to go. She wanted to go back home. He said. Fuck was his next thought. As the sun began to head down behind the trees, Matt and Roy stood in the hallway of the hospital, staring out the window. Down the hall, in a room flanked on either side by uniformed cops, was the woman who had shown up claiming to be Ashley. Roy had just explained the footprints and where they led. So what are you saying? Matt asked. I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. Roy said. To his left was a set of windows overlooking the woods around the hospital. Soon, those leaves would be changing, showing off dazzling colors. The sun would be too low for those on the ground to see much more than shades of pink and orange in the sky. From up on this floor, however, the sun still shone. I just know what I saw. Matt cursed and paced back and forth in a short path from one wall to the next, he jammed the heels of both hands into his eyes. Neither he nor Roy had been sleeping very well these days. Matt had been smoking a lot lately, too. His clothes reeked of it. I don't understand any of this, Matt said. How many people have we interviewed? A few hundred, Roy said. Not you and me personally, but the police. We've tracked suspects to five states surrounding this one, Matt stated. Six, actually. We just tracked one in Michigan, Rory corrected. Probably a thousand phone calls, maybe a million tips from emails to voicemails, all of it tracked down to nothing. Rory nodded. Yeah, about covers it. And what do we have to show for it? Matt turned to face Roy, his hands out as if pleading. Nothing. Nothing which indicates Ashley was taken. No bones, no remains, no list of suspects, no indication of where she is or what happened. Matt slapped his hands down against his thighs. Now this, he said, pointing down the hall. Have you ever seen anything like this before? What do you think? Of course not. So what's the play here? Matt asked. What do we do? 
We wait for her to come around. We ask her questions. We go through this like detectives. Matt laughed. Are you getting as bad a feeling about this case as I am? I have from the first day, Roy admitted. From the moment I first went into the cut-through with you, something felt off. Remember when Tim's parents called us the day after we talked to him? Matt asked. Roy did. She said he told them he and Josh felt dizzy walking through the path, the cut-through. Josh confirmed it the next day. I remember. Matt's face looked pained. Out of nowhere, and seemingly for no reason, he said, I joined the force to make a difference. I'm guessing you did too. Roy confirmed. I wanted to find the bad guys, but it all sort of made sense. I mean, it'll never make any fucking sense to me why guys murder other guys or anyone hurts kids in the first place, but they're people. Some people are just fucking evil. This case, from the get-go, has not made sense. There's been no bad guy. Now that he had explained it, his frustration made sense. It crystallized Rory's own feelings. I know. I feel the same thing, Matt. I look like a hard-bitten cynic. I am a hard-bitten cynic. But the same things got me into police work. The moment we set foot in the cut-through... This entire thing has felt like a walk into crazy town. Matt did a little more pacing. Roy watched him walk back and forth. What are we seeing here, boss? Matt asked, looking down at his shoes. Just between you, me, and this chair. What are we talking about? Doppelgangers? Alternate realities? UFOs? What? Roy shrugged. You think I know? We just have to work the problem. We have to ask her questions and find out what we can. Did you see the mark on her leg, Matt? Matt thought. Yeah, I did. When they were getting her into the hospital gown, I saw her leg. It was there. The birthmark. Could you see the scar over her eye? Yeah, it stands out. I mean, they told us about that day one, but you can really see what a nasty fall it must have been. She has a lot of other scars, too. Things which look like bite marks, for Christ's sake. It's hard to fake birthmarks, Rory said. Maybe you could do a scar, although why you'd want to, I have no idea. I suppose you haven't been close enough to see the flecks in her eyes? Matt shook his head. Not yet. I don't want to admit the fantastic any more than you do, Rory said. I've been on the force for too long. Always the pragmatic one. I'm closer to retirement than you are by far. I want to retire without having something like this over my head. They'll remember the strange case of the alternate reality more than any of the other cases I've solved. There has to be a reasonable explanation. Matt declared. He pointed down the hall. There has to be a reason for all of this. She's a fake. She has to be an imposter. A crazy person, but an imposter. This opens up a whole new case because we have no idea where she came from or why she's scarred. Why was she naked? Rory agreed. So, what do we do now? Are you staying here in case she wakes up? Where do we go next? I don't know. Matt said. Yeah, I think I'll stay here. I can catch a nap on one of these chairs, or maybe they'll let me crash out in an empty room. Mary Dent sat in her living room, her hands twisting and turning in her lap. John had decided to lay down. She couldn't join him. Her mind raced, with thoughts twisted just like her hands. She had the markings. Mary went over and over it in her mind. The woman at the door had the eyes, the scar, the birthmark. Plus, there was just the knowledge which came from holding her daughter in her arms. A feeling you knew your own child. A familiarity which only came from being a parent. It had felt like Ashley. Mary had raised her daughter to think for herself. To dream and imagine, but also ground herself in reality. 
The world was built in such a way you had to do this with your kids. They had to know the realities of the world. There were bad men and bad things out there. Mary was not a religious person, so she didn't force a religion on Ashley. There were no sky genies or magics to bring about your dreams. You worked hard, you became good at things, then your dreams followed. But now... Mary stood up and walked slowly to the front door. She turned the knob, but paused to listen for John. She heard nothing. Perhaps in the bedroom, he was snoring the way he always did when he was asleep, but she heard nothing now. Quickly, she opened the door, trying to minimize the telltale squeak of the hinges, which always alerted everyone someone was coming in or exiting. It was dark outside, although the horizon still held traces of red descending to purple. The streetlights were on. The insects in the forest preserve off to her left had started their constant drone. The pond straight ahead and just past the homes across the street held bullfrogs which croaked their odd songs. No one was out at the moment. Perhaps everyone had seen what happened or were afraid to let their kids play. Usually there would be people out with their dogs or kids still running around. Nothing now. The sound of traffic rushing past from the nearby road, the bugs and frogs, but just an oppressive quiet elsewhere. Mary stepped onto her porch, then down the steps into the grass. She realized she had forgotten to put on her shoes. No matter. The grass felt good on her bare feet. She walked down the lawn to the sidewalk. When she looked down, she saw the same muddy footprints Roy had seen earlier. Mary walked across the street. She turned right, her head down, and followed the footprints. Eventually, she turned left and found herself at the same place Roy had. God damn, she whispered. Tim had said Ashley vanished in the cut-through. Josh had repeated a similar tale. She also knew the police had been over every square inch of the pathway. Down on their hands and knees, the forensic people had inspected the ground. Mary thought it looked like they were inspecting each blade of grass. They had found nothing. Mary walked across the driveway. The houses on either side were quiet, their lights off. Despite this, Mary felt as if she were being watched. Her toes reached the grass at the far end of the driveway. The bushes and trees reminded her of fingers reaching to grab her. The pathway appeared even more hidden. There were no more footprints here as she reached the paving stones. They were cold and wet, more so than the grass. Soon, she was beneath the arched entrance to the cut-through. Overhead, the branches of two trees entwined like the hands of lovers. Something small buzzed in her ear, and Mary slapped at the mosquito. Overhead, the stars had started to poke through the velvet of the sky. She trailed her right hand against the tall wooden fence to her right. The coarse wood felt a bit spongy and damp from the recent rain, but the fence also felt solid. No gates or doors, nothing which might open and snatch a child, or release a grown woman. Mary reached the middle of the path. Here was the point Tim and Josh had said they grew dizzy. Tim said it was a fraction of a moment. The hairs on his arms had stood up, and he felt lightheaded. Then the feeling was gone as fast as it had arrived. Mary stood there. She raised her arms slowly over her head. Her fingers extended into the air, trying to feel the energy the boys described. Come on, she whispered. Come on, show me, take me. For a moment, she heard another buzzing in her ear. Annoyed, she slapped again at her head. She realized the sound was not in her ear, but inside her head. She felt a brief tingling against her fingertips. The sensation extended down her hands. Her head filled with images. Images of darkness and cold. Images of horror as unspeakable evil reached back towards her. Hungry. 
so hungry, so alone, wanting light and life, a darkness with teeth. Behind it, a vast emptiness which she could not possibly describe. It was an endless, infinite loneliness and longing. Then it was gone. Mary gasped, snapping her hands back down to her shoulders. She clutched at her own face. Suddenly, she felt almost naked and utterly alone out here. Around her were homes, some now showing lights inside, filled with life. Out here there was darkness, and beyond this place was more darkness. Deeper, more intense darkness than could be comprehended was close by. Mary could still feel it. The tingling was gone, but the dark thing had seen her. It was here, with her. She couldn't see it because the thin film of reality separated her from this hungry void. She could hear strange whispers and languages she did not understand in her mind. Where's my daughter? She asked this living darkness. Give her back. There was no response, but she felt it moving around her, as if it were a dog slowly sniffing around her feet. Mary backed away slowly. She waited for the sky to open. She would see the teeth within the darkness. Mary waited for the portal to encompass her, suck her in. Instead, she nearly tripped over the paving stones. Her bare heels skidded off the edge of the stone, and the sudden sharp pain snapped the trance. Fuck you, Mary hissed. She hissed it at the stone, but also the thing she had felt inside her mind. Mary backed down the driveway. She expected the portal to open. Perhaps her baby girl would tumble out. It didn't happen, and when she reached the sidewalk, her gaze finally broke away from the path. She thought of the birthmark, the scar, the gold flecks in the eyes. Could it be? By the time Mary returned home, she knew she'd need to speak to the woman at her door. She had to know. Matt Dreyfus curled his legs in tighter to better fit on the awkward chair down the hall from the hospital room. Why did every hospital seem to shop from the same furniture stores? The armrests were too small, made from some hardwood used for torture. Hard cushions made from some strange faux leather. No mortal could possibly get rest on these. Matt had managed to drift off for a bit, but his dreams were full of strange sounds, grotesque images of murder, and an endless darkness. He feared the young woman down the hall was projecting her thoughts into his mind. Now, it was about ten o'clock, and the hospital had switched to night mode, most of the unnecessary lights were off. The guards beside the door down the hall sat in plastic chairs straight out of some classroom somewhere within the hospital. The bright fluorescent lights reflected in the polished tile floor, presenting dozens of miniature suns shining in Matt's eyes. He sat forward, adjusting the denim jacket he had been using as a makeshift blanket. Yawning, he stood and stretched, his back and shoulders popped. What the fuck was he doing here? What the fuck was going on? Matt had been raised a Christian, but the world had changed those beliefs over the years. Now, he wasn't so sure. If there was a god, it was pretty obvious he, or it, didn't give a shit about individual people. To think otherwise was arrogance. Mostly, he felt the world spun alone in an endless blackness. 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 The word echoed through his head, not in his own voice, but the voice of the woman claiming to be Ashley. It was the one word she had said to him when he tried to talk to her in the ambulance. The one thing he knew, she was filled with fear. The phrase which came to mind when he arrived at the house was feral. This woman was barely human in her mannerisms or appearance. Matt put his jacket back on and strolled down the hall. Somewhere, a floor polisher shushed and swirled like some whispering beast. The two uniformed cops stared at their phones. You guys okay? 
Matt asked. The cop on the right looked up. We're fine, detective. I think she'll be out all night. She looked exhausted. Matt had to agree. Like she'd been through hell. Who is she? The cop on the left asked. Did she really claim to be the missing girl? Ashley? Not in so many words, but she knocked on the dense door. She called Mary Mom. That's fucked up. The cop on the right stated. So, if she's not Ashley, who is she? The cop on the left asked. I don't know, but whoever she is, she's been through a lot. You should head home, detective. The cop on the right said. We've got things covered here. If she wakes up or if someone comes for her, we'll call you. Thanks, but I promised my partner I'd stay here. If she wakes up, I want to be here to ask her questions. You should at least ask for a room or a bed somewhere. The cop on the left yawned and stretched. These chairs are like torture devices. <laughs> the scream was sudden, and so loud it nearly knocked all three cops over. It pierced the silence of the floor like a knife through fabric. Matt jumped, lurched against the wall, his hands at the side of his head. Both uniformed cops stumbled from their chairs, instinctively grabbing their pistols. The scream was unlike anything Matt had heard before. There was no buildup. One moment the hall was quiet, save for their whispers to each other. Then there was an ear-piercing shriek from within the room beyond. Something inside the room fell over with a clang. The next thing Matt noticed was the scream did not end. Ashley, or whoever she was, didn't pause to take a breath. Instead, the cry got louder. Then, beneath the high-pitched tone, was something else. Something which made Matt instantly think of movies he had seen about exorcisms. Jesus! Matt stammered and ran into the room. The woman was pushed against the wall at the far end of the bed. Her knees were pulled up tight against her chest. The red mane stood out all around her face as if electricity ran through her. Her countenance was a mask of pure terror, with her mouth open and eyes wide. Ma'am, calm down. Matt called out. Finally, the young woman drew a breath. The scream still continued and she tried to back further into the wall. One hand scratched at the wallpaper. Matt saw the hand had no fingernails, just dried blood as if she had clawed at things before, ripping the nails out at the bed. It's not real! The woman wailed. It's not real! None of this is real! Matt extended both hands toward the woman. He moved slowly into the room, near the foot of the bed. The woman cowered from him. Ashley? Matt said. Your name is Ashley, right? The scream finally stopped, but the look of pure terror on the woman's face remained. She had both arms outstretched against the wall. Her eyes looked like they might pop out of her skull as she watched him. Is your name Ashley? She nodded slowly, but bared her teeth. I think so. It's the name I remember. But was I really Ashley? I don't know. You're not real. I'm not here. I'm in the dark. This is a dream. Matt nodded as if he understood completely. I understand. This all must seem very strange. This is all real. I'm real. Look, you can touch me. He yanked up his sleeves, bearing his tattooed arms, and extended them toward the frightened woman. He held his palms open as if approaching a violent dog. Nothing in his hands, no weapons. Distantly, he heard footsteps running down the hall. They were coming to sedate her. He had to hold them off. Slowly, the woman crawled forward, sniffing the air. Once again, Matt was reminded of a wild animal. She extended a hand and touched his fingers, then the tattoo of a butterfly on his forearm. You're Matt... She asked, studying his face. I am. Detective Dreyfus. Matt. You're real? 
I should think so. I feel real, don't I? She clambered back toward the end of the bed, near the pillows. Her eyes were wide and frightened, rolling around and around in her skull. I don't know, she said. Just then, the door burst open. Two nurses and a doctor came in. The nurse at the front held a needle in her hand, which created a brief sparkle in the overhead lights. Ashley immediately started wailing again. Back away, Matt shouted to the medical staff. He held out his left hand to them. Just back away. Everyone back away. We're under instruction to sedate her. The nurse in the lead said defensively. I don't care. Matt replied. We're talking. I just had her calm and you burst in here and set everything off again. Would you want someone running at you with that fucking thing? He pointed at the needle. The nurse looked chagrined and backed away toward the door. All three of them looked frightened, but ready to jump on the woman. Good, Matt said. The woman in the bed was once again pressed to the wall. Tears streamed down her face. They're gonna send me back, she said. Matt, they're gonna send me back into the darkness. I want to stay in this dream. I want to stay here. Matt approached the bed cautiously advancing slowly like maybe she was a rattlesnake about to bite. He edged towards the woman. No one is sending you back, he stated smoothly. Ashley, we just want to find out what happened to you, so just relax. You've been seriously hurt. The doctors just want to make sure you're okay, so they want to give you something to help you calm down. They've got needles, she hissed. Like the darkness... Like the darkness with teeth. They want to bite me. No biting, Matt said, casting a glance toward the nurse with a syringe. There might be a little bit of a pinch, but it won't hurt much. Then it will relax you. Don't you want to get some sleep? Ashley shook her head emphatically. No, no, I've been in the dark for so long. It's there, behind my eyes, lurking in the shadows. I can feel it. She put her hands to the side of her head, intertwining her hair and her fingers. I can feel it in my head. She continued. It's in there now. It whispers to me and tells me horrible things. Horrible things. This isn't real, is it? It tells me this isn't real. Matt leaned forward and reached out his hands. He took a risk and touched her hands, half expecting her to claw the skin off his forearms. He was even more dismayed when she scuttled into his arms and clasped to him. Are you real? Are you real? Is this real? Are you real? She kept asking again and again, the words running together until they were random noises. Matt held her, offering soft shushing sounds like he would a baby. As she clung to him, now weeping against his chest, Matt waved one arm toward the nurse. She came in fast and stuck the syringe into Ashley's arm. A fast stick, faster than a bee. See? Matt whispered, running his hands through her hair. It felt coarse and unwashed beneath his fingertips. See? It didn't hurt, did it? Over so fast. Now, just relax, okay? I'm real. This is really a hospital, a real bed. Shh, shh, just relax. Eventually, he felt her muscles relax. Her constant blather eased. Then she slumped against him. After a moment, he slowly eased her back down onto the bed. He was out of breath. It took a second to realize he had been breathing shallowly. His back hurt. His arms ached. Thank you. He said to the nurse. The woman looked terrified, shocked. She disposed of the needle. That woman is fucking crazy, she said. Matt nodded. Maybe, probably. The two cops from the hall stood just inside the door. Both had their guns in their hands, but looked equally terrified. The resident and second nurse also held similar expressions. 
I think we can relax a bit. He stated, not believing a word he was saying. Nothing at all about this felt remotely relaxing or normal. She should be out for the night, right? The nurse nodded, but still appeared shocked and horrified. She should have been out all night with the first shot. Thanks, Matt whispered. Thanks, very encouraging. We should restrain her. The resident added. No, Matt replied. No way, this girl is traumatized. If we restrain her, the screaming will never stop. You take full responsibility for that? The resident asked. Yes, absolutely. Now, everyone, get the fuck out of here. Get out of the room, please. None of them looked like they wanted to leave him there, but they didn't know what else to do. The crowd backed out of the room, and the door slowly closed. Matt stood there for a moment. What the fuck did he do now? It was much too late to call Roy. He wanted to be here if she woke up again. Matt walked across the room and sat down in the chair against the wall. He cursed when he realized the chair was nearly as uncomfortable as the one in the hall. Jesus Christ. He whispered. The next morning, Tim got a call from Josh. It was early, so he knew this wasn't good news. Nothing good happened when you got a phone call and it was before breakfast. What happened? He asked the moment his friend was on the phone. Did you hear about the woman claiming to be Ashley? Josh asked. Tim had not. He had been in bed pretty early the night before. The weeks since Ashley vanished had flown by. There had been accusations from other kids at school to deal with, but it wasn't as bad as he thought it might be. Most of the kids were scared. You could see it in their eyes. Other kids had stopped going to school via the cut-through. What the path did to Ashley, Tim wasn't sure, but kids were scared. He went through it, however, because he felt closer to his friend. Sometimes, when he was halfway across, he whispered Ashley's name, hoping maybe she would hear him wherever she was. Josh filled him in on what he knew. Most of it came from listening to his parents trying to talk privately between themselves the night before. Josh was an expert on spying, and often got interesting ideas from eavesdropping on his parents when they thought he was asleep. The rest he got from chat groups on social media. She's crazy, Tim said, eyeing his own mother, who went back and forth in the kitchen getting coffee or prepping toast. Ashley's our age. How could a woman be her? I don't know, but be careful. If it is her then something really weird is going on. If it's not, then crazy people are running around out here. Why would crazy people care about this place? Tim mused. Ashley missing is crazy. Crazy things bring out crazy people. It made sense, in a way. Josh was not always a deep thinker, but this had a sort of logic to it. Like attracted like. Crazy disappearances might attract crazy people. Tim talked for a few more moments, but barely paid attention. He wanted to see this woman. He wanted to see her and see if he would recognize her. The day had suddenly gotten a lot more interesting and frightening. Roy arrived at the hospital before the sun was up over the trees. The night before had been relatively sleepless, his dreams had been full of a kind of darkness which was alive, an insane women with claws, claws and teeth. He managed to doze off about 30 minutes before his alarm dragged him into consciousness. When it did, he found text messages from Matt about the night before. He did not have a good feeling about today. Anything else happen? Roy asked Matt once he reached the right floor. Matt looked more than a little rough around the edges. No, the detective replied. I slept, or tried to sleep, in the room with her. She stirred a few times, cried out once, but she didn't wake up and scream again. Roy nodded, but studied his partner. Something's bothering you, 
Spill it. Matt sighed. You should have heard the scream, Ray. It wasn't human. It went on and on, louder than anything I've ever heard. Deeper than her voice. Rory raised his eyebrows, but said nothing. Matt rubbed a hand over his face. It was like she was possessed. Matt said, exasperated. I know that sounds nuts, but it was. We both discussed the crazy last night. Rory stated plainly. You see me laughing? If she's possessed, the question is, by what? Are we talking demons or something else? I don't know. That's not all. She doesn't think this is real. What's real? Matt waved a hand in the air. This, you, me, the hospital, she thinks wherever she was is real. This is all a dream. She calls wherever she was the darkness. I dreamed of darkness last night, Matt. Darkness which was alive. Hungry. Matt just looked tired. What am I supposed to do with this, Rory? What does that mean? Rory shrugged. I don't know. We're heading off the map here, partner. Uncharted waters. Here, there are monsters. Yeah, big ones. Rory put a hand on Matt's shoulder. Go home. Get some sleep. When you've had at least six hours, come back. I'll sit in the room with her. If she wakes up, I'll try to talk to her. Matt was too tired to argue. Yeah, good. Just be careful. Of what? I don't know. But all this feels dangerous, doesn't it? All wrong. That's how I'd put it. It was mid-morning before she stirred. Rory sat in the same chair Matt had attempted to sleep in the night before. His back ached and his head hurt. Twice he had nodded off, only to snap awake. Once he had nearly panicked when he wasn't sure where he was. It was the second time he awoke, nearly jumping to his feet, he found the woman in the bed, staring at him. Seeing her eyes wide and boring into his skull caused him to cry out. Oh, you scared me, he said. Bad dreams? Her voice was barely a whisper. Rory's heart hammered loudly in his chest. Pardon? You were having bad dreams. I have them. I think this is a dream. But then, where I was before now was a nightmare. Dreams within dreams. Rory stood up, stretched, and walked behind the chair. With effort, he slid it across the floor until he could sit next to the bed. He sat back down, crossing his legs. All the while, the woman who called herself Ashley watched him. You feel like talking? He asked her. She moved around on the bed, scurried down to the end where Rory sat. She folded her legs together and came to rest cross-legged. Her eyes burned with intensity and seldom blinked. I can talk. She whispered. I think I can. I could always talk in my dreams. Rory didn't know what this meant, so he made a mental note to come back to it. First, let's start with the basics. Rory stated as gently as possible. What's your name? The woman looked confused for a moment. I think my name is Ashley. You think? She shook her head cautiously. I'm not sure. It's the name I remember, but I haven't been called by a name in a long time. I remember my friends and my mom calling me Ashley. You don't happen to remember your last name, do you? Rory continued. He took no notes. He was trying to make this seem like a conversation rather than an interrogation. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I sort of remember something. Something with a D. Dunce? Don't? Don't? She paused, closed her eyes, her face screwing up into an intense look of concentration. Rory could not help but think the face made her look like a child trying to remember something in a dramatic way. Dent? 
Yes, I think that's the one. Dent. Ray nodded. Okay, well, can you tell me what happened to you? What do you mean? Ray shifted in his seat, cleared his throat. You said you were in a dark place. Now you're here. How did you get in the dark place? I'm, I'm afraid. She whispered. Ray leaned forward. Why? If I speak it out loud, then this dream might end. I might find myself in the dark place again. The darkness hurts, Ray. Her eyes went left and right, as if looking to make sure the coast was clear. Her paranoia was infectious. Roy felt tingles run up and down his spine, and found himself looking around the room too. No one came in. The walls did not disappear. There was no portal. A monster did not come out from under the bed. However, there was an odd feeling in the air between them. Roy noticed a slight ringing in his ears. Let's try to go back. Rory continued. He kept his voice calm, steady, even soothing. Can you tell me anything you remember before the darkness? It was a dream. She protested. It's okay. Rory held up a hand. If you remember a dream, tell me the dream. The young woman sighed, shifted her legs on the bed. I was home with my mom. The woman whose house I was at before I was here in the hospital, that was my mom. I was a little girl. So long ago. It was so long ago. She reached up one hand to scratch her head. She looked confused for a moment. Right before the darkness, I was at home. I was eating cereal and talking to my mom and dad. My friends were coming over. Tim and Josh. She stopped. Her head snapped around. Where are Tim and Josh? They would know all about me. They were my friends. We'd walk to school together. Tim and Josh are still here, Roy said. They live in the same houses. Her eyes lit up. Can I see them? Roy held up a hand. We'll see. Let's continue with the story. She nodded. Okay, I can do that. It was morning, and they were coming over. We were going to walk to school. I spent the day at school just doing school stuff. Then I left school and was supposed to walk back with Tim and Josh. But Josh wanted to run. They ran. Towards the cut through. She had been running a little behind schedule, and she recognized it, which made her worry. She could see Tim standing outside with Josh, and both of them looked annoyed. It was all Dina's fault. Dina had stopped her as she was trying to leave to ask her about a math assignment. This was not uncommon, as Ashley was always good with keeping track of the assignments in a notebook she carried around with her. However, it was never enough to just give Dina the assignment. She always wanted to talk, and this held Ashley up. Once Dina was assured and Ashley was able to break away, she dashed for the front. As she got near the door, she started to run. The moment she did, she locked eyes with Josh and knew instantly the jerk would make her chase them. There was a twinkle in his eye and a cocky smile on his face. Please, she thought. Just wait. I don't want to run. She sent the thought toward him. Sure enough, he tapped him on the shoulder, and they both broke for it. Damn it. She mumbled under her breath and started after them. They were just teasing, of course. The three of them always teased each other and played pranks. Ashley and Tim had run away from Josh before. Josh and Ashley had run away from Tim before. They scared each other in the cut-through by popping out from the shadows at each other. Pranks were part of their friendship. To be honest, this was a pretty tame one, and Ashley was fast. She figured she'd be able to catch up easily. Ashley put a surge of speed and ran into the driveway of the school, right into a blaring horn. 
She gasped and looked to her right, startled to see just how close the front of the car was in relation to her entire tiny body. Her face flushed red, and she held up a hand, mouthing the word sorry. The driver looked just as startled as she did. Now the boys were further ahead, and it galled her even more than before. She put on another burst of speed and ran after them, up the far curb, across the grass. Then it was a hard left across a sidewalk, ducking past other students and their parents, then down the curb and out into the street between two cars. This time she paused to ensure there were no cars coming. She was across the road and heading into the cut-through just seconds later. Josh and Tim were right at the entrance of the path, and she could hear them laughing at her. Ashley found another gear and put on another burst of speed. She laughed too, because it was pretty funny. Oh, she had such plans to punch Josh when she caught him. She would send him home with bruises. The boys ran into the path. She was so close. She could see the back of Tim's head, the hair there just above his neck. For a moment... Everything was so clear she could see every curl, every strand. There was a bright flash. (laughs) Ashley raised her left hand up to her eyes. It was like a camera flash. She yelped as a bright circle of light formed inches above her, then expanded until nothing, not her hand for certain, could blot out the light. No one could hear her, and she suddenly could hear nothing. She couldn't see Josh and Tim. She felt the ground change beneath her feet. Then she was on the ground. It was dark, absolute blackness. She called out to her friends, but her voice echoed and sounded strange. The enveloping darkness was alive. Something pierced her neck. Another unseen thing grabbed both arms. She heard fabric tear, and soon realized her clothes were being ripped from her. She opened her mouth to scream and felt something slimy and snake-like creep around her head, over her mouth. Then there was a presence against her entire body, all along her back. The pain which followed consumed her. Thousands of tiny needles pierced her skin, up and down her body. Her mind filled with images of horror, blood and guts, torture and murder. Her mind felt as though it were on fire. Billions of tiny fingers in her brain, tearing her thoughts. A voice whispered into her mind she belonged to the darkness. Relax, accept, allow it to feed. She passed out, but it happened again and again, countless times. Sometimes there would be some light in this new world and she'd run towards it, but could never reach it. The things would hurt her, feed off her. She prayed for death, but she kept living. No matter how she begged or screamed, it fed and she lived. She ran for a time, but she could never get away. It was everywhere. She got used to the dark. She never needed to eat and became addicted, in a way, to the feedings. Somehow, the darkness fed her while also consuming her. She was special, the voice whispered to her, unlike any it had found before. Then the light came, and this time when she ran, she wasn't caught. She broke through. The light of this dream world pierced her eyes, and she ran to the one place she could recall from her dream life— She dashed home. The young woman, Ashley, sat back after finishing her story. The entire time she had been speaking, Roy maintained a steady face, but inside it filled him with dismay, fear. He held her gaze the best he could. The steady gaze, despite the story being told, was a tactic he had learned long ago, A person's eyes twitched certain ways when they were lying. This woman's eyes had not twitched at all. During her story, she stared at him, locked into his gaze, not even shifting left, right, or down. I think my memories of being a little girl here was the dream. She said, now her voice quivered. 
Maybe the dark place was real. Am I really home? Is this really the place I left? Rory sighed. What now? Just how delicate was she? How crazy? Or, worse yet, was what she was saying the truth? Rory had stared down guns. He had been in the same room with men or women who had savagely murdered people. He had felt anxiety and some stress before, but he was never afraid. Rory knew the job he had to do. This time, he was afraid. Although he paid lip service to Matt about finding a logical explanation, and he still hoped for it, he was thinking there was no normal explanation. I'm not sure what to tell you now, he said. Here's my problem. You say it brought you to wherever you were, in the darkness, through a bright light. You were there for years. I mean, looking at you, you appear to be a woman in her 20s. Rory rubbed his beard. Lord, he was tired. His head hurt. The problem is, Ashley Dent, in this world? He continued. Vanished just three weeks ago. She should still be a little girl of ten. The woman's mouth and eyes opened in surprise. For a moment, it looked like she was going to laugh. Then her mouth snapped shut. You're lying, she said. She crawled back to the opposite end of the bed. Her face showed fear, but also a burning intensity in her eyes. Roy felt an uneasiness he was not used to. Are you going to lose it? He asked. You're lying. She repeated. I think you might be. Roy countered. He made a very sudden decision that the time for games was over. If she was going to snap he'd deal with it. The young woman looked shocked. Her head snapped to the side as if he had slapped her. What do you mean? She asked. Exactly what I said. Rory said. You are obviously traumatized. I believe that. Someone or something hurt you. Hurt you badly. But I don't think you're Ashley. The young woman moved fast. One moment she was hunched by the pillow at the far end, the next she was in front of him. She scuttled across the bed like a spider. Then who am I? She hissed. Rory retained his cool and did not recoil. He kept his gaze down at his leg. His other hand was near the butt of his gun. I don't know, Rory said. I just know my partner and I are searching every database across the country. It's only a matter of time before we figure it out. I told you the truth. Roy sighed. I think you told me what you have chosen to believe is the truth. I think you were horribly abused and somehow heard about Ashley's disappearance. You incorporated this into something you could latch onto in your mind. You created this story about darkness and portals to protect yourself. I don't think you've done any of this with malice. Nothing out of anger. He looked up into her eyes. The burning intensity there was like staring into the heart of a furnace. I'm not trying to unsettle you. He went on. But the police have been hunting for Ashley Dent. She's made national news. I don't think you want to be a part of that. We need to find out who you really are. The man or men who did this to you need to be found. They could try to do this to someone else. The young woman pounded a fist on the mattress. I heard them talking about me. I have the birthmark, the scars, the eyes. True. I don't have an explanation. Do you? I was born with them? Roy intertwined his fingers across his knee. I see. I want to go home. Not yet, Rory replied. The doctors won't let you anyway. You're nearly starved. Suffering from exposure, they're worried about infection. You'll be here for a little while. The woman again appeared agitated. She cursed. Do I have to be under guard? She asked. I think so, Rory confirmed. 
The media have been all over this case. So far, they don't know about you. If they find out, they'll be here. We need to keep this quiet while we figure things out. You need to stay here, and no one other than me, Matt, or the medical staff should see you. I'm in prison. She stated, her voice hollow. It's like still being in the darkness. There's light, but I'm still not free. Can my mom come visit me? Mary? I don't know about that. You freaked her out pretty well when you crashed on her doorstep. The best I can do is tell her you asked. It'll be up to her. The woman settled down, sitting back against the wall and stretching her legs. It was as if the exhaustion hit her hard and suddenly. Rory figured it must have been just like that, given whatever she had gone through. I'm Ashley, she said as she yawned. I can't explain how I got where I was or back here. I can only tell you I was there for years. Roy stood up. We can do a DNA test. Would you be agreeable to that? She nodded. Yes, if it will help make this place real. Nothing here feels real. Mary Dent sat in her bed as her husband slept beside her. He slept a lot these days. When they were awake, he was still asleep. Whenever she tried to talk to him about Ashley, he would find a way to change the subject. He just went to work, did his thing, came home, ate dinner in silence, went to bed. Only Mary wandered the house, staring at her daughter's toys and belongings. Mary got out of bed, moving slowly and carefully as she put on a robe and sneaked down the hall. The nights were the worst. The darkness seemed like something which would attack her. It certainly assaulted her mind. She worried Ashley was in the dark, locked in a basement, perhaps buried underground, chained up in a closet. Now there was this woman claiming to be her daughter, her grown adult daughter. It was impossible, yet some part of her clung to the idea. Even having a wounded, mentally unstable, but alive daughter was better than thinking her daughter was dead. Mary walked into Ashley's bedroom. It was the room of a girl in transition. There were posters up now of boy bands. Magazines on the desk also incorporated various young heartthrobs. At the same time, the head of her bed was covered in stuffed animals. Off to one side, near the window was a dollhouse she sometimes still caught her daughter playing with. There was the baseball bat she used to play Little League near the glove. She had a skateboard leaning against one corner. Near the closet and within, there was the collection of Barbie dolls and subsequent accessories. Her daughter actually had a record player off to one side and a growing series of vinyl records and milk crates. Her daughter was wonderful and complex, she was a mix of sports, girly things, and coming teenage things. She was great at art, and examples of her work were taped up on the walls. Mary sat down on her daughter's bed. It felt so small. She grabbed one of the stuffed animals, a tiger, but found she couldn't remember the name Ashley had bestowed upon this one. She held it to her face and inhaled deeply. She could smell soap, shampoo, and probably sweat. Ashley had liked to sleep next to this one, sometimes using it by laying it beneath her head. Mary felt the tears come. They had come so many times in the last three weeks. When Ashley had first gone missing, she thought she would cry and never stop. She clutched the animal to her chest and rocked. More than anything, she wished Ashley was sleeping in the bed next to her. Mary had often peered in on her daughter's room while she slept, dreaming big dreams for what she might do with her life. The possibility seemed so endless. Mary closed her eyes, and when she did, her mind suddenly filled with images of absolute darkness. The sensation of trying to run, but not being able to get anywhere, filled her imagination. Then there was the feeling of being grabbed, a million needles piercing her skin, 
followed by the feeling of losing some essence, some part of herself. Always wanting to leave, to find a way home, to escape, but unable to do so. She gasped, her eyes popped open. She felt something within her mind, something inserted there against her will. The room spun around her, and she felt dizzy. Mary tried to get to her feet, but found herself unable to do so. Mom, Mom, Mom I need you. you. The thought was printed in bright yellow against the blank wall in front of her. For a moment, she could see it all very clearly. Then the image faded. She heard a little girl crying in the room's corner, near the closet. When Mary turned her head, she clearly saw the image of Ashley sitting near the door, holding her stuffed animal to her face the way Mary had been holding the tiger. Help me. Help me. The voice was that of the Ashley she knew. Little, ten years old or younger. Not the woman the police had taken away. However, Mary knew this was the older woman reaching out to her somehow, reaching out into her mind from the hospital where she was being guarded. Mary stood up, the dizziness gone. She had to go visit this woman. She had to talk to her. Once she did, she would know. She wanted to go right now, but there would be no way of getting to the woman's room. She made her way back down the hall and climbed back into bed. She was certain she would not be able to sleep, but the moment her head hit the pillow, she was out. Tim bolted upright in bed. His heart hammered in his ribcage like some frightened bird in an enclosure. His head hurt too, and his entire body was covered in a glaze of cold sweat. The covers had been kicked to the floor. Jesus, he whispered. He had had a nightmare, a truly horrible one this time. Dark, biting, draining, chasing him continually, always trying to leave, to get away. Then, just as he was sure he was going to die in the darkness, Ashley's face appeared. She grabbed him on both sides of his head and looked him straight in the eyes. I need, I need your, your help. help. She said in a voice which was a mixture of the Ashley he knew and this older woman who claimed to be her. Help, help me. This was when he snapped out of the deep sleep. The last remnants of the dream clung to him. He stood up and ran to the bathroom. He knelt down and gagged, dry heaving into the toilet for a bit. He did his best to do so quietly so his parents wouldn't wake up. When he was done, and sure he would not throw up all over the floor, he got up and drank several cups of cold water from the tap. He seemed endlessly thirsty. When he got back into bed, he was positive something would jump out of the shadows, he reached across his bed and turned on a light. His mother didn't like it when he slept with a light on. It wasted electricity, and it was for babies, but he felt better. Ashley needed him, or the woman claiming to be Ashley needed him. But he was a kid, and he couldn't do anything. Could he? Then a thought revealed to him. Ashley's mom. Perhaps if he went to her, she might get them into her room. He settled back down against the pillows, settling his head down. He smiled. Tim felt better now with a plan in place. He was asleep moments later. That night, the young woman lay in bed, but she could not sleep. Her head felt as though it were on fire, she reached out with her mind, hoping to find her mother. Why she knew this was possible, she would not have been able to say. Her thoughts had been strange from the moment she dropped back into this world. The sudden onslaught of color and light had been her initial explanation, but it hadn't gone away. It was as if her skin itched all over. Her eyes burned. All of her dreams were of the void. Now it had gotten worse. From the moment she woke up this morning, she felt something different inside of her. She heard a voice inside her head, felt a strange sensation in her stomach. At some point during the afternoon, as the doctors took her blood and vitals, 
she suddenly had clarity about what had happened. Every time the dark thing had taken from her, it had left a little bit of itself within her. A little microscopic drop of its essence had been added to her. Over the years, this had built and built. Evil goes both ways. She whispered to the empty room. The thoughts in her head burned and created images which terrified her. She felt her mind reach out to her own mother. She needed her mother, but some part of her was telling her that her mother was a lie. Everything here was a lie. She needed to destroy it. Destroy her mother. Get the little boy, too. Tim. She remembered him so well. They had always been closer than she and Josh. In fact, she might have had a bit of a crush on Tim. She couldn't remember for certain. She reached out to him, too. She had never had these abilities before, but she felt the darkness inside of her, and her mind was open. The young woman got down from the bed and walked into the bathroom off to the right. She turned on the light and stared at herself in the mirror. She gasped. Tendrils of darkness squirmed around the whites of her eyes. They were like tiny black tentacles instead of the red blood vessel she expected. Then she saw something move beneath the skin on her face. She clutched at her cheek and suppressed a scream. She could not let the police guarding her know about this. They would lock her up for sure, perhaps down in a place almost as dark as the place she had escaped. The young woman choked back a sob. It did no good to cry. She wasn't even sure she could anymore. She had to reach out. She had to convince her friend and her mother to come. They had to believe her. If they could recognize her, they might be able to convince the detectives and then she could go home. If she could get home, things would be okay. If she was home, could make this world real, she might beat back the dark thing. She made her way back to her bed. When she climbed in, she pulled the covers up as high as her nose. The room was far too dark. The whispers in her head grew dim, but still there as she drifted off. What would you do if time itself had bent sideways and the world you knew turned upside down? Questions minus satisfactory answers when the night comes out. You've been listening to When the Night Comes Out, a weekly horror anthology podcast with stories by Brian W. Alaspa and narrated by Ali James. Music by Vivek Abishek. For Brian's work, visit his website at brianwalaspa.com or visit amazon.com for his books of fiction and nonfiction. Be sure to listen to Ali's work on Facebook at Ali James Projects. Visit our website at whenthenightcomesout.com to learn how to support us on Patreon.